Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. Welcome to this week's Island Influences, and this is a slightly different episode for you. This time, Roy Moore, who I interviewed several episodes ago, is a legend in Isle of Man TT, asked me could he possibly interview my husband, who is a bit of a a local golf legend himself. So this is where Roy talks to Jules, so they reminisce over their love of golf. So apologies to any non-golf fans, but... If you're a golf fan, you're going to love it. They're going to amuse you with their life stories and some personal experiences of some key matches and tournaments in well, local golfing history and much more. Hope you enjoy it. We're away and running and we're out here at St John's on a beautiful autumn day, uh, which would be ideal for golf. And golf is the subject that we're involved in. Uh, my name's Roy Moore, one times Ireland champion way back in 1968, but Uh, associated with Thornton and Associates is uh, Julian Sutton, who on the championship in 2021 created a unique record, former eight times champion, but uh, made it through to the qualifying stages in seven decades. And Julian, you must feel a bit old when 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 somebody mentions that to you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it was... uh it was something I was I was aware of, I suppose, and um, uh, I I think I think I told Jed Power that it was, a, and I, I think his response was something like, "Hmm, I'm not sure what that means, really." <laughs> yes, it uh, it doesn't feel that long ago that we we were playing together in the championship right at the very beginning, but uh, it obviously was. Well, uh, you, you paid me the ultimate compliment, really, because uh, of those who've got good memories, remember 68. You, for a reason, I think it was a breakage of an arm or something like that. You were, your football was your, your key sport, and then something happened, and you had to take up golf. Uh, well, I broke both arms at the same time at school when I was in the first year at Castle Russian by falling off some apparatus onto well uh, I didn't fall on my face because my hands got in the way but I managed (laughs) to break both at the same time. I I had started to play golf in Port St Mary because we lived there and the golf course was just over the back of the cronk and dad and mum played so uh, I used to go up there and of course the course was always quiet and we had a uh, a few clubs. Dad's, dad was left-handed, so um, I really didn't try with those. So we we acquired some some right-handers, I guess. Or well, did my mum start a bit later? Anyway, I had a few few clubs and used to bash around there uh, and got quite interested. And um, then I had this accident, which put me out of out of play for for a few months. Um, but uh, I came back and arms felt fine. There was no no problem, and the the, as people know, the the initial trauma of having a breakage can um, it can often be resolved and forgotten about eventually. So, so that was good. Um, although I did break my right hand, right arm again by slipping down some steps outside our house in Port St Mary when I was in the third year. So, uh, so <laughs> I did. Uh, so I had a right arm in plaster, obviously for I think about six weeks. So uh, I do remember trying to play. Um, two-handed and then letting go with the with the right hand, which was the broken one, as we got near the ball. So uh, they didn't go very far, but you could, <laughs> it was still out play. So. Enthusiasm, yeah, yeah, because in '68 you'd come along to watch the championship, and you made paid a, an ultimate compliment to me when we finally beat Bill Stead at the uh, 36th hole. That. Uh, it was like a revelation, like just like you do now when you go to a tournament and see how how the top men perform. Uh, you came along in 68 to have a look, but then you qualified to play in the qualifying rounds in 69 as a schoolboy. Yes, yes, I was um, 14 and I think I probably had about a, a seven handicap by then. So I was, you know, I was keen uh, and having watched you play and Bill 
uh, in the final and uh, being amazed how far you were hitting the ball and um, sort of a year on I was I was up a, a, some sort of a level anyway um, and I remember it being at, uh, at Peel. In fact, uh, as we know, Peel is covered in trees these days and um, I think it was 71 that the, the then captain Tom Archard, who was I think was head of the forestry at the time decided Correct. that yeah. they, he was going to put some trees uh, on the course but there is a, a picture of sitting on a bench I can't imagine who took it and um, somewhere around about the second or the third sort of looking out, out across the course and there's not a single feature <laughs> it's just a, like a bare field because there wasn't a single tree in sight whereas now of course it's very ornamental and with all the trees and uh, a lot more difficult than it was then so. The Congaree, as it was affectionately known. The, yeah, the what? The Congaree. The Congaree. Yeah, that's it. And the old photographs show that. And now entirely different through uh, planting and what have you. But you got through the uh, qualifying. You qualified with 148, which in in those days would be... Uh, you know, I have got the records to show you where exactly you finished, but... Certainly, uh, you, you got through and you played the, the star of the, of the time in Adrian Copley in the semi-final. Yes, yes, Adrian was a, a very impressive golfer, actually. He had a, a rather unusual way of, of, of swinging the club. He had a sort of forward press and then took it back, but he, he sure uh, delivered some speed to the ball and... Uh, um, yes, he was he was very impressive, um, and I think the first time that we went to play in the Northern Counties, he had the best round in one of the rounds, if I remember rightly. Probably would, yeah. yeah, yeah We've, Gosford, so. We have brought the books for that because that will be on discussion later on, and we'll leave them with you so you can mm. reminisce on those. But I recall, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd probably been knocked out by then. I'd probably just be getting used to being a Sammy Boyd, probably would have seen me off because him or Ray Ennett, uh, I should have had them sitting on me mantelpiece after after winning in 68, <laughs> the number of times they beat me. But I'll never forget a shot you played on the 16th. I think you chipped in from the back of the green. I think Adrian was about three up and yeah. people were saying, oh, this lad's going to go far and he'll be one to watch for the future. And then he's three down with three to play allegedly and then you chipped in and uh, chipped in yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yes i sort of remember that um i do remember in the qualifying rounds um the seventh which was uh, um, a par five and sort of played like a par five in those days holding a wedge shot for a three which was the first time i'd ever done anything like that um and to do it in the championship was was quite something and then i think the following year the um the hole at at uh, Douglas, um, no, it must have been the Ramsey. Ramsey. No, the, anyway, the the next time, the first time I played at Douglas, the fourteenth, which was the hole going down the hill, I had a two. I hold a nine iron, so I'd had, and I must have had an eagle at, at Ramsey somewhere along the line because I'd had sort of three eagles each time I played, which was um, great to do it when it really mattered, as opposed to when you're out on your own when nobody cares. So. Yeah, for marking it down, if you'd be in the two sweep, you'd be okay. Yeah, so qualified appeal with that one for eight. Lost to Adrian in the in the semi final. I think did Adrian go on to win it in sixty nine? Maybe, maybe not. I think so. We've got the records there yeah. anyway to do it. But I'm then, surprised you don't remember, Roy. You know, no, well, I've uh, remember yeah more than Google does. <laughs> I've got I've got it all here at the flick of a switch, as so to speak. And uh, but rustling pavers is not very professional, is it? He don't do it at Ramsey Airpin, so why do it when you're talking golf? But qualified at Ramsey and I do know about this because I suffered at your hands in uh, the last eight I think it was where you seen me off but then uh, again only 15 years of age then and uh, lost out to Tim Watson in the semi-final Tim going on to make the final on that occasion one down who was close mm. um, I do have a, a memory of the 18th green at Ramsey missing a very short putt. I mean, we're talking very short putts. But I, um, I think it might have been against uh, Tim, but um, it could have been another occasion. It was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the sort of memory that you really want to take forward but uh, I have got it in there there were 
the, there were a few short putts that were missed, whereas you never missed anything. Anything from six foot, you were able to coax in um, whatever the surfaces or whatever. I was always enormously impressed with your ability to get the ball in the hole from yeah, a few you, feet. I wish you would come back now. <laughs> <laughs> you do tend to be when you get a bit older, and uh, as Rory and many others have demonstrated uh, before us that... Uh, it becomes a bit of a hardship, uh, whereas you take it naturally. And that was another thing that you you were naturally, you're naturally left-handed, but you played golf right-handed. Well, I, I write left-handed um, very badly, it has to be said. Three or four years ago, I thought my writing is so bad, I'm going to teach myself to do it right-handed. Um, but I gave that up after a week. <laughs> so um, I'm probably more right-handed um, uh, doing things it's just I, I right sort of left-handed really so. yeah another thing that was uh, always impressive was that from a very early stage obviously family support is is in paramount in 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 family and uh, your mum your dad very and uh, yeah they, they were always supportive of you yes yes oh yes they they uh, went out of the way to to help um and of course, in latter days, my mum um, wasn't able to walk around quite so well. So she um, had got some sort of little three-wheeler thing that she would sit on to, to play. Um, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think my dad, I think my dad was too embarrassed to get on it in public. Um, so she would trundle around trying to keep out of, out of the way, which meant that she was always in somebody else's way. <laughs> So she'd be in the middle of the wrong fairway with somebody else on the tee waiting for her to go over. Although <laughs> I didn't see it, but I believe she did actually run the father over. Watching, which was to general mirth apart from him. <laughs> yeah, because uh, again, uh, thinking back, I mean, crowds are quite quite good now, but in the old days, if you can call it that. With lack of entertainment and lack of television, they used to get a good... In fact, they used to charge uh, people to watch the finals. Yes, yes, they did, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, you yeah. you had to um, buy a little ticket, which you had to show to get in and watch. Yeah. There wouldn't be many watching now, would there? Well, <laughs> it's it's a different, uh, different thing, which we're going to come to at a later stage, like because we're still back in 69, 70, and that 69 put you into the first decade... 70 followed it on at Ramsey with what we talk about that. But then it came to 71, and that was memorable because the Isle of Man had been accepted to play in the Northern Counties in 71, and that's now 50 years ago. Yes, yes, it is. So isn't we've it? just started to do that, but it was the down on the records here, which we've got in front of us, qualified with 153 at Douglas, which wasn't as good as at Peel, but better than Ramsey. Uh, but then again on a quite tougher course and made it through to the final and you beat there to get your first championship win the man from Ramsey who'd come through similar kind of things been watching golf decided to have a go at it and John Conrad sadly no longer with us but uh, you managed to see him off by six and four in the final what's the the account of that I, I followed it round for 36 and was very impressed by this, what would be then, 16-year-old? Yes. Uh, I don't really have much in the way of memories of that, oddly. Can't help you on that one. Can't help us on that one. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I expect you to be able, uh, Roy, to uh, recount most of my golfing exploits. I've sort of, well, I know Roy will know. Yeah. So I forgot myself. Yeah, well, it has a Roy will know if he just leans down to the right-hand side and picks the books up, but... Uh, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why we've actually been instrumental in doing all this. Well, uh, it's, it's there for somebody yeah. else to do it, but the, mm. the the kind of memories of actually being there, I know it was a kind of a, a shy Julian Sutton who stepped forward to receive the championship trophy at Douglas Clubhouse. And John Conrad was no mean player. He, he made a, down Ramsey he'd, he'd kind of uh, established himself down there but it was a fairly easy win if I remember rightly it was just pure ability that got you through <laughs> well there's always there's always luck involved isn't there the uh, you get the odd good bounce and that can make the difference between sort of one going two up or one going back to to square so 
Um, yes, he could certainly play, couldn't he, John? John what a nice guy. Good, yeah. And then you had to then arrange yourselves because the championship was always held in May. And yes. People might not think, well, why did they hold it in May? In the early days, there was an awful lot of people who were involved in what was then a booming tourist trade, boarding house keepers, etc., who played. Mm. And they always said, oh, get the championship out of the way. Before TT week, we're going to be busy. We couldn't play June or July. And you, you took a chance, really, on, on the condition of the courses uh, at that time of the year. If you had a, a bad winter, well, you couldn't guarantee that the course was going to be in, in good condition. And we played on some... Grim <laughs> venues, really, to be fair, just through through the winter. Uh, yes, well, middle of May, of course, it could be really cold as well. Uh, I've sort of memories of, on occasions, sort of being out uh, towards the end of the field, and it was always, was it 99 he used to yeah, play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Over 100 on occasion. Yeah, it could be really cold and getting dark and uh, uh, quite a challenge at times, I think, Um Yes, uh, I guess most people don't don't remember that we played then. And, of course, we played on a Tuesday night and then a Thursday afternoon for the uh, the last eight. And then you sort of promptly turned around, if you were fortunate enough, and um, went into the semi-final Thursday night. And then um, the final on Saturday afternoon and evening. Correct. Yeah, that's the way it was. And again, Thursday qualifying... Uh, some on on occasion we played Thursday qualifying for the simple reason because Athol Street with the lawyers who played it was golf at that stage it'd be hard to imagine was more for those who could afford it it wasn't for mm -hmm. the boys from Pulley and Spring Valley who came into it and they had a half day on a Thursday mm -hmm. so yeah. that was the reason that uh, the qualifying was on Thursday but then we headed off. You were selected along with myself and Ray Ennett and Adrian Copley. We all headed up to Gosforth. But you'd, I, I, something in the back of my mind saying that you didn't travel with us from the island. You were already over there. Is that correct? Is this is where Julian Sutton University started? No, no, that would have, no, no, I was, on, I was 16 in 71. Um, no, we went up with, uh, I think we went in a minibus and Will Kirkpatrick had his fine B green BMW. Do you remember that? Club? Correct. Yes, that's yes, right. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right. Um, I think, uh, and the, the following year, we we uh, went to Hillside, I think. Yep. And uh, <laughs> we carried our clubs off the boat up up. <laughs> up into town to get the uh, the train, train. To, towards Southport yeah. and climbed off at Hillside. And uh, <laughs> I know when we travelled up, Bill Stead did the driving and the, the, those memorable things. I remember we stopped at a, a motorway station halfway up and uh, to get something to get sorted out and get the phone ringing and away we go, that's it, you know. But uh, you kind of took advantage of Bill's hospitality, knowing that he was a petrol mogul on the island and that he would be not short of a bob or two. So when he says, uh, get what you want, boys, and uh, we all kind of diplomatically had a cup of coffee and a bun, but Julian came back with steak and chips and things. <laughs> Six donuts. Yeah, and, and it cost him about £3.60 just for you. And uh, he never stopped talking about it all trip. <laughs> Yes, yes, that was uh, probably not one of my best moments. The thing was, though, <laughs> when we got up there, we were we kind of arrived, and I remember the the secretary of Gosforth Park, which is the the, the venue for that Northumberland, were in the in the chair, and uh, that we we kind of piled into the car park, and the the, the secretary immediately <laughs> came out to see. He thought it was like the travellers had arrived to park in the car park <laughs> overnight. And it wasn't the case. And we all explained ourselves. And he was very, very kind of uh, sympathetic to our ignorance. <laughs> but you played with a chap called Howard Clark, I think. I, I did. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Who was um, an exceptional talent and uh, had already played for England, I think, full international. Oh, he was certainly not far away. And, of course, he played in the Walker Cup, I think, the following year. He's probably the youngest ever who played. And uh, 
he hit 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 a golf ball like nobody I ever seen um, probably before and since he was uh, he was quite exceptional. So it was a, it was a treat to play with him. But he didn't have any worries about whether I was going to outscore him or not. If I remember <laughs> rightly. <laughs> No, and we, we, we did all right, and we, we, we kind of established what was required. Yeah, uh, The fact that you're every other county, uh, we're all dressed the same, was, yeah. was, was noted pretty quickly. Yes. And just generally, you know, the preparation for it. Yes, it, uh, was, a, it was a great event. And I, um, when we'd established that we were probably going to be seventh out of the seven, seven yeah. it certainly took the heat off the minor counties who were always <laughs> <laughs> vying not to be last. So, so at least we uh, we gave uh, <laughs> we were accepted quite nicely, I think, on that basis. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a good one. It had, uh, yeah, and fifty years ago, and we've competed every year since. Mm. Uh, provided players that are capable of going away um, again immediately that you you enter one of these events you're at a disadvantage because of the handicap straight away you're going to yeah. automatically be a minimum probably of about 10 shots worse off each round mm. but we learned from it uh, we never got a team photograph you wouldn't believe and you know the reason why no yeah we were all there ready to get a team photograph and uh, bill stead was was i think late late playing and right. he'd come in and there was a chap who said can we have the isle of man team for a team photograph because we didn't have cameras or anything like that it's hard to imagine isn't it <laughs> well why didn't you take your phone out and take a snap <laughs> of the team yes and I've got the book, I've got the results, and I've got everything else, but I haven't got a team photograph from there. Following on, we did. But Bill Stead said straight away, he said, no, no, not likely. He said, I'm having my tea. <laughs> and that was it. There was no point, <laughs> in, it. There was no point uh, in five of us and the officials. Well, going out. Yeah. five would have been better than... The non, yeah, it? well, that yeah. was it. Yeah. But I, I can bring that to mind as well. And then we thought we'd done well to start with. This is uh, following the Ireland champion in our team. Uh, but then we went to uh, went to Hillside the following year, and that was we were we were kitted out for that. We had yes. the matching jumpers from Osborne's or whatever <laughs> that was was suitably <laughs> priced. <laughs> And we looked apart, and we had a little Manx badge on, which caused a lot of, which always does, causes a lot of attention. But then there was something dramatic that happened on that occasion as well, wasn't it? Um, well, I, I remember we all sort of wandered through the car park carrying clubs and uh, and suitcases, and I remember I think Sammy. Boyd said something like, here we are, the rag raggle tag of gypsies have arrived. <laughs> yeah, it was that way. Uh, I played with Rodney Foster that year, who was uh, kind of a bit of a legend in golf, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, played well, obviously, but as a team, we failed to co complete the distance. Yes, 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 we did, didn't we? Um, yeah. Tim Watson um, was playing with uh, Dr. David Marsh, who was the... Uh, England luminary at the time and um, Tim wasn't having a very good day and I think uh, in the end he didn't want to hamper uh, Dr Marsh any any further so uh, he uh, didn't go back having lost his drive somewhere on the I think it was the 17th wasn't it, it second was, yeah. round yeah. and um, he uh, just couldn't bring himself to slow everybody else down and walk all the way back to the tee while he played another one knowing that um, the, the score wasn't really going to make any difference whatsoever to our our final position, which was seventh again. Seventh, yeah. Uh, um, so he NR'd, which was uh, unheard well, of. Well, it, yes, um, you can. You know, you you've been in the position yourself. Uh, I'm sure where uh, <laughs> it's like, oh no, right? I'll have to go all the way back then, and everybody else is just wanting to press on. So. I had some sympathies. There, there was um, with him. There were there were one or two comments who weren't particularly <laughs> sympathetic. <laughs> I, know that, yeah. uh, like, I suppose uh, you'll never play for the Isle of Man ever again. Uh, yes. I'll see to that, and then there's certainly other. Yes, and yeah. I'll, I'll always remember with the, uh, you know, bear in mind that when you went into the the counties, they were they were rich counties. We yes. were, uh, maybe Sam was right in his description. 
and that we were kind of in those early days, the ragtaggle, bobtail, <laughs> gypsies, <laughs> travelling Wilburys or whatever it might be off, yes. the, off, the, yes. off the event. And uh, one of them took great delight at the presentation in his far back voice of saying, ha ha, I see the Isle of Man are still at sea. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I, I remember Ha ha, and that was a little round of yes. applause. And yes. I think Willie Kirk with steam coming out of his ears was about to, <laughs> to, to plant some Launch weird into something, yeah. <laughs> thought better of it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was uh, 72 and you, you were the second time champion there. You, you, yes. you, you travelled away in 71 as... Island champion yes. held on to the title in '72, but it was a tough battle with uh, Ray Ennett at Peel. Yes, yes, Ray was a very determined uh, opponent, as as you know, and um, uh, he was uh, always hit the ball in play, and he was a good putter, and that's always a good recipe for uh, success as a as a match play player, isn't it? So uh, yeah, Ray was. Uh, and on Always a, tough. On a shortish course. But then again, bear in mind, Peel, as you've already said, with the, the extra trees, uh, was a bit tough because they had hedges across yes, the fairways. Yes, of course. I've, yeah, Hedges yeah. and out of bounds, internal out of bounds everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but I think probably back at those days, they didn't have the pop-up sprinklers system. So Not I quite. remember, yeah, I remember the greens being small. Uh, and pretty flat. Um, so if you could actually, you were having a good day and you were hitting most of the greens, you had lots of birdie opportunities. But once the the watering system got on there, the, it, somehow it seemed to make the surface of the greens um, follow the contours of the ground underneath. And as we know now, they're they're uh, anything <laughs> but flat yeah. for most of them. There's all sorts of angles and humps and hollows to and negotiate. Again. We've had the, 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 the kind of added attraction of watching the fourth develop. Yes. Ray Hughes from Faulkner's uh, went backwards and forwards a few times with a drot and created the fourth green, whereas yeah. when we played it, in, and especially in 72, I would suggest, when uh, you beat Ray, that uh, it was a shorter one down was, to where yeah, you probably your drive corner. arrives now. Yes, yes. It was, uh, it was, yeah, much shorter, but there was a... A bunker or two sort of right in the wrong place to stop you get getting at the green wasn't there there was yes yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so peel and then three times a champion again ray ennett provided the opposition uh, you'd beaten him two up and my my uh, peel and then uh, you did battle at ramsey the thing i remember about that one particularly was that uh, sometimes when the head of uh, greens committee if the particular club says they're not going to uh, they're not going to destroy our course, they yes. become a bit stupid on pin positions. <laughs> and I can well recall that uh, there's a fellow called Harold Swain who'd put masses of fertilizer on, got the greens green, but absolutely no pace in them whatsoever. But then decided on the day of the final that he would put the pins in such ridiculous positions that it was very very difficult and i felt as though ray was a bit unfortunate with some of his shots just right. just yeah. not quite getting over the bunker and falling back in and yes yeah yeah one up was could have gone either way but, on well that but that's that's right isn't it you uh, six inches the ball lands and falls back um or hops the other way and uh, uh, makes all the difference um i was watching a wee bit of the golf from this last weekend and uh, Rory McIlroy had one like that um, where he uh, he was sure he left the, the ball short and it just just landed on the top of the bunker and hopped forward and finished six inches away instead of plugging in the face of the bunker and uh, that would have, I think he won by one, didn't he? So, he did, yeah. So it happens to the best. It uh, does. But then there's a, a gap, and this will probably be where we mentioned earlier on that uh, Jay Sutton made a decision that he was going to be a dentist. Well, I'd... Uh, that was <laughs> a weird thing to be thinking of, a <laughs> fatal extraction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because I think I was about 13 and um, I was waiting on the first tee at Paul Rose to go and play. Um, we had the, the ball in a shoot in those days, as you remember. Yep. And um, somebody who came around the corner and 
oh, hello. Um, so he said, you, um, you want to think about becoming a dentist? He said, I've been trying to get into see Howard McGee, who was one of the, the well-known dentists in Douglas in those days. And he said, and he, he plays golf Tuesday afternoon, he plays golf Thursday afternoon. He can't see me this Saturday morning because he's playing golf. And then he's off next week for a week to play golf somewhere. And uh, I thought, hmm, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that was pretty well it. And I sort of decided then and there that uh, I would be a dentist at about the age of 13. Um, it was interesting because my uh, cousin, who was a, a girl, a year older than me, um, completely independently decided she was going to be a dentist, um, although I don't know what, what point she decided she was, But we, because uh, we had no connection with dentistry other, <laughs> other than being on the receiving end, uh, <laughs> like the rest of us. Uh, so that's how I ended up doing dentistry. Industry. So he had to go to university to do that. And that period of time, 73 to 78, where Julian Sutton doesn't appear on any of the championship qualifiers, three times champion. Uh, you came back in 78, then after doing the university, qualifying, obviously. Yeah. Not well, qualifying for the championship <laughs> during no. that time. But. Well, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to um, join a, a club in Cheshire. We, we uh, played the university golf at Royal Liverpool. Um, Hoylake? Yes, Hoylake, uh, which was a wonderful course and a club. And uh, as students, uh, amazingly, they pretty well gave us the, the freedom of the club on a Wednesday. And we would all turn up and there'd be a couple of members uh, knocking around. And we'd play in the morning, we'd play in the evening, we'd in the afternoon, we'd stay all evening, play snooker. Um, and were fully welcomed, which was quite remarkable, really, considering it was such a fabulous <laughs> club. Um, so I managed to join Wallasey as well, because I had a contact who, who was one of the lecturers in the dental hospital. In those days, I don't know whether, it, I don't think it still applies, but if you wanted to change your representative county, you had to have a year where you didn't play for either. The first year, I, I think, I, obviously, I must have some part point thought well this is probably a good plan I'm going to be there for four or five years so uh, I didn't play in any county championship the first year and then the second year I was able to play in uh, Cheshire stuff and they had a uh, as well as well they it was interesting because they had a 72 hole stroke play championship and they had a, a knockout championship two independent ones so I, I think I played I must have played in those or one of them without any any distinction I, I was that. tied tied to Cheshire for probably three years and then you had a year off where you didn't do anything so um so I think it must have been three years at, sort of with Cheshire and then finally back to the island when I got back in 78 beginning of 78 Liverpool had a, a really good university team. We had some excellent players and we we won the um, representative in our area. We won our Northern Universities Championships and then we went to British Universities and we won that at least a couple of times as well. So we were, we were some excellent players. But I remember the, possibly the last one I played was at Royal Aberdeen. So we went all the way up there to play in... Um, late June, early July to play British universities. And uh, I got drawn with um, uh, an American because uh, Brigham Young had sent a team. Um, and the last time they'd done that, a uh, team of four included Johnny Miller. This guy I played with was phenomenal. We, uh, we, we set off and I think I played really well for about seven or eight holes. I was like one or two under, as was he. But then I reverted to form, whereas he carried on. And <laughs> <laughs> I think I was still perfectly happy with 71, 72, but he did a 64 which was the course record on Royal Aberdeen. Um, and you then, signed it? Uh, I signed it. So the next day, he, he wasn't as good, but he was only 68 around a different course. And his name was John Fort. And he, he turned pro. And on the, on the um, PGA Tour, and I think at some point, he won two tournaments in a row, back to back, which was pretty unusual. Um, and then I didn't really hear anything about him but I have a feeling that the 
last, the previous Ryder Cup that was held in the US, he was the course designer ah. for that course where they'd had the Ryder Cups. That would be four or five years ago, wouldn't it? So, yeah. So he was he was quite good. But the 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 best memory in a way was that um, sixty four qualified of all these students to play match play. So it was similar to um, the Island Championship. Yeah, you played two rounds and then. Um, so 64 would, would qualify. Um, the thing was, it was actually just past the end of term. So most people were heading home anyway. So there were lots of withdrawals in any case, but it was the sort of honour of, of qualifying. And amazingly, they had 17 people who try, who tied on the same score and they needed something like eight or nine out of these 17 to, to fill the, the 64. So it was decided that they would play, they would have a sudden death playoff and they would do it the best way was to play. All 17 would play. (laughs) You can't be serious. (laughs) The one hole. Yeah. So 17 of them set off, followed by all the, all the other students who, some of whom had been finished a long time. So... There was general mirth and merriment and lots of beers and these everyone had played <laughs> off and it was it was you know a late June night and it was a, a fabulous day and it must have been about ten o'clock when they <laughs> but, finally decided and uh, it was I remember it was quite a difficult hole and out of the seventeen three put it within about a foot so they were okay. And uh, so we we ambled on, and uh, you included you, was it? No, I. I and you're just I watching. Uh, yes, yes. I uh, I don't. I can't remember. I must. Have, yeah, I'd, I'd qualified. I think, but anyway. Um, so we we ambled on, <laughs> watching all these guys, um, and I think they took about seven holes to to get the final the guy. But decision. a seventeen man sudden death playoff all at once. Um, that was the way to do it. It was uh, makes a complete, the complete one off. Makes the Isle of Man Golf Union sound normal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was quite brilliant. It really. Yeah. Was. I think I might have missed out uh, when you went British Boys Championship. Uh, yes, I. Start, well worthy of mention. I first played that when I was about thirteen. I think we went on a camping holiday to North East. Um, Scotland somewhere, Dunbar, and uh, I was way out of my depth, and probably was for the next two or three years. But the uh, the year I was sixteen, um, I got through to the semi finals. This was at Barassi, which was on up near Troon on the Ayrshire coast, and uh, ended up playing Howard Clark, who went on to win. Um, as I say, he was just a, a sensational player. Uh, and I think in the final he he hold out he had a hole in one um, hold out with about a seven iron straight into the into the hole without touching the side slam dunk slam dunk yeah he was he was quite astonishing so yeah so I got the semi final of the of the British boys which was uh, impressive uh, we yeah. have had, we have had a Manx winner and this yes. is a bone of contention either when I were to compile on records. There was a chap called David Ball from Rowney who won the championship in 57, I think. And he was only a schoolboy then. Yeah. But when your championship win came along in 71, we know you would have been, what, 15 at the time? 16. 16. 16. Yeah. And I haven't had difficulty trying to find out who is the youngest ever winner. Yeah. So I haven't resolved that as yet. Right. Uh, yeah. So Dave, David Ball did win our championship. Yeah, well. yeah. 57 right. at Douglas, as it worked yeah. out, which is a comparison to yours at Douglas in 71. Right. So, so we, it might we, come down to months. If we knew when he'd won the British boys, that would be an indication. Yeah. Hmm. I can remember him coming back to Rowney. Uh, his father ran Rowney course yes and uh, came back to Rowney and there's a prominent picture in the in the clubhouse down there of him getting off the plane and Les Sheard right uh, correspondent yes. there yeah. but uh, probably just getting just getting to the semi-final went unnoticed uh, <laughs> in, yeah. in your case but it brings us up to date I think in those early days and continuing on and then you came back in 78 and uh there's a man who beat you at Peel when you'd qualified with one four six, three times Ireland champion up to then. 
a chap called Peter Cubbon. And he was a bit of a character, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Peter's a good lad. And uh, he can play too. And uh, I must admit, I was very disappointed. And um, I remember sitting there and uh, Thursday afternoon, so I got beat and uh, everybody just sort of disappeared uh, out of the clubhouse to go off and uh, play in or watch the semi-finals. And I was... Uh, I think Pig Sick comes somewhere into, <laughs> into yes, yes, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've been there. I've been there. Yeah, yeah. yeah we all. Have. We don't go into this. This is this is your show, Jules. We, if we've yeah. got a spare couple of hours uh, yes, tomorrow yes. or something like that, I could yeah. come down and go through all the the, yeah, the tears and the tantrums and the the near yeah. misses. But uh, yeah, you, you Peter Cubbon beat you, and as you say, you have to sit back and. You don't Take think it on the chin. You don't think you're going to Just recover, go. and then you don't. But then no championship 78 and no championship 79 because there was a new kid on the block. Yes, yes. A chap called Gary Wilson who started his golf up at uh, King Edward Bay, or House Drake as it was. Uh, he proved to be as capable as you. Mm. In, uh, yeah, well, uh, he, uh, he was very, very impressive. And, of course, he uh, loved playing and loved practising. And uh, so where where did we... Did well, he, he beat you with Peel at uh, 79 uh, in the final as it as it worked out. Qualified at uh, 150 right. at Ramsey. No, my, my apologies. Uh, Peter Cubman beat you at Peel in 78. 79, I think uh, Gary Wilson won the championship in 78 in the Ray Tier final. Oh, yes. Then 79 with 150 at Ramsey. Uh, you got through to the final, but it was Gary Wilson you played, and uh, six and four goes down yes. alongside the. Yes, uh, that's the, right. Um, I, I, I caddied for you. Yes, ha, that was. Yeah. Well, uh, that's probably the reason you lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure not. Absolutely, uh, but I remember Gary playing one shot. I, th I think it was the. I was probably three down or something after the first round, so there was some hope still there, and then. On the first hole, he pulled it into the rough, and out of the rough, which is sort of holds the ball low, he managed to hit a, a sort of long iron onto the green, um, which was like, I couldn't have done that. How did he do that? Yeah. So um, I think he won that hole and moved on, but yes, it was very impressive. Gary always hit driver off every every tee that he possibly could. There was never any sort of laying up, and uh, most of the time it worked out for him. It did, yeah. And he had a period of time there where he kind of dominated, so, yeah, it's uh, still in the news to this day. Yes, yeah, well, he, he did um, turn pro, didn't he? he? Turned, yeah, that's For a little while. You went to university, he turned professional with the help from a chap called George Chattel. Right. Down at Peel, who found a couple of grand, which was sufficient at the time to, right. to yeah. go on. And he felt as though he was a good investment, but well, uh, it didn't I, work out. Well, I think Gary won his tour, what was the equivalent of his tour card then, didn't he? Um, I he seem, earned money. Yeah. He did earn money. Well, I seem to remember that he, he got his card um, in that year. And Ian Woosnam, who was still a fledgling, I suppose, didn't. That was one of my memories about it. Um, but uh, obviously Gary could recount, um, you know, the, the tournaments that he played in mm -hmm. and so forth. But then obviously he must have got his amateur status back. back. Yeah, which was difficult to do in those days. Yes, I don't, I have no idea how, how it works these days. Yeah. But you, you had to sort of serve a, a, a nil period, didn't you? A you year did. or two yeah, or three yeah. or something before you were allowed to so come back. become an amateur Quite a again. few did try. Derek Chad, uh, yes. you know, and in later years, uh, Steve Ellis, uh, yep. Bobby, Bobby Cowell uh, had a go, didn't they, to, to turn pro. But it wasn't an option for Jay Sutton because he'd spent all this time at university and he was establishing himself as uh, a mm. dentist. Yes, Probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I wasn't going to win any money playing golf. <laughs> well, certainly you would have thought that uh, dentistry would be a lucrative way, yes. of, way of earning yes. a living. Well, I, um, I suppose I felt I would always come back to the island. And um, uh, Mr. Ball, who ran the practice at 
uh, Castletown. Uh, he did three days a week at Castletown and two at Peel. Well, he'd had a heart attack six months before I finished and was told that uh, he really, for medical reasons, he should stop work. Uh, so the, the the health services here told him that I might, I would probably be turning up. And so he made contact and uh, in due course, um, I took over the practice at uh, Castletown uh, from him. So <laughs> straight, straight from dental school into running your own practice, um, which... Uh, so I was 22 and running my practice. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many people would actually go and see a 22-year-old with their teeth. But anyway, it was fine if you could take them out and show them. But if they were actually attached, it might have been different. Um, <laughs> so, so I suppose one of the advantages was that he, had, he did three days and I had five days to do it. But the, the other amusing thing about it was that the chap who'd been his assistant had been helping him at Peel um, and took over the Peel practice and ran that for a while was called <laughs> Harry Herring. 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 Harry Herring was running a from dental from practice in Peel. Peel. God dear me. Five extractions <laughs> for a shilling. <laughs> <laughs> well, fancy that for Harry Herring in Peel. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah. It makes Julian Sutton almost sound <laughs> normal, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. Almost. Yeah. But yeah. It continued on, and I know you often talk about uh, 1981. Uh, I think I don't think I carried for you in 81, but uh, another kind of legend if Manx Golf, we've talked about Peter Cubbon and Gary Wilson, but Godfrey Kelly had been a footballer and taken up golf when he'd there, and... Uh, Everybody knows we're not too far away from Peel at the moment. And come on, Peel, would be a shout that you would hear from Godfrey on many an occasion. Another real character from the West. And uh, he got the better off you on the uh, 37th. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, Cal could certainly play. And uh, once he won, he sort of moved on uh, as a uh, as sort of character-wise and... Uh, uh, you know, very um, well eccentric isn't the right word, but I suppose no. it's one word for it. But I remember it's Sammy just, just Kel. Yes, I remember Sammy Boyd saying, "Look, look at Kel. It's all your fault. You let him win." <laughs> <laughs> I remember being um, like two down with three to play, and then I birdied the sixteenth, and then I birdied the seventeenth. So we were level, and I hit a. A really good shot on the last hole into about six foot. So I had that then to win. And um, you know those sort of shots where the putts where you know there's a there's a fall to it and you concentrate yeah. on getting the line right and you forget to hit it and it stopped about an inch short. So we went down the last hole and uh, the the first hole and um, which was the thirty seventh of course yeah. and. Um, we both hit second shots on, but um, not very close, and put it up to two and a half feet or something like that. And Kel put it first and hold his. And uh, with my frailty with short puts, I managed to miss. So, so he won. He won. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty seventh hole. Yeah. And he never let you forget. No. 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 <laughs> no. Um, although he did uh, the. Give it me back because uh, we Douglas, played. I think was yes. it was. Um, yes. What year would that have been? Um, Semi final. Yeah. I think yeah. he beat Barry Collis at 84. Yes, that possibly. might, have, might yeah. have been it. Um, Cal was, was uh, one up playing 18. I think. I hit it onto the green and he was, he was close and chipped up close and I got mine up and um, a gimme for a three. So he had about it. Two foot. Yeah, it wasn't much. I can picture it now. Downhill. It downhill, left and, to right. And he very gently tickled it down the hill and it stopped short of the hole from about two feet, uh, which was uh, um, unexpected, and, yeah. I think, because yeah, <laughs> he was an extremely good putter. Um, and then um, we went down the, the next hole and I think I drove it onto the edge of the green and two-putted and uh, and made a three and one. 
pin on the right hand side yeah Mackenzie Green and yeah, you, you just, did just uh, got it onto the left hand yeah, edge didn't yeah. get it over the bunker close enough and Jay Sutton won and went on to uh, yeah well that was it so that would be the thing but uh, that would be like three championship wins and then the fourth came in 82 at Rowney but there was another character on the scene another former yes. footballer yes. called Kevin Lippo Clark probably if you say Kevin Clark you'll think of Premier Print but this was Lippo Clark from Paul Rose United and the People's Champion yes. it was around the time of Alex Higgins and he classed himself as the people's champion. <laughs> and the people's champion was six up, I think, at one stage, wasn't he? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what I was doing, but it wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I remember um, standing on the 15th tee and thinking, what am I doing wrong here? And then I did something quite different. I um, can't remember quite what it was. I thought, well, I'll try this. And uh, it came right out of the middle of the club and went onto the green. And I, I think I three-putted, but it was like, ooh, a bit of a revelation. Right, I'll do that. And then um, I made three and then three at birdie on 17, birdie on 18. Um, so the things were looking a bit better. A bit better and yeah. then birdied the first, part the second, birdie the third, birdie the fourth. So that was like, I don't know, six or seven threes in a row, and then smacked one up the fifth. So we, we must have been about level at least by then. And then somebody said, some wag said, well, I'll bet a hundred quid you don't make a three up this one. <laughs> 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 Which was true, because it was the fifth, yeah. <laughs> but a five. So. Over the hill, the yeah. bell hole. Yes, yes, that's right. So, the bell hole. Yeah. Um, Yes, he could play too, couldn't he? Could he? Uh, he could hit the ball for forever. But he had an easy-going attitude to everything yeah. as well. And, yeah, certainly that would be a memorable one. That gives you championship number four, the official margin, uh, three and two. We won't talk too much about 1983. Qualified with one four eight at Ramsey. Fifth championship win, beat Roy Moore nine and seven. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> moving quickly on to 1984, and again you qualified with uh, one four six at Douglas, which wasn't shabby then. Uh, no. Sixty nine, and mm. those were the type of scores that you you, you were you were gradually finding had to be a roundabout to get into the last 16 the standard was improving yes yes indeed um i have a memory of playing at douglas when i didn't qualify and um somebody came onto the 18th tee walked up a uh, spectator and there was like well what's the what's the sort of what's qualifying the score what's the what's cut, cut going to yeah. be and he said well 147 might sneak in and i was like hmm <laughs> <laughs> oh I can't even hold him one because I've had a one four. I've had one four seven, seven already seven, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for thirty five holes. So yeah, to be so fair, the old the old guard had gone really, hadn't but they? But one four seven was oh, a yeah. really good yeah. qualifying score. Yeah, that that was as the times changed and golf became available to all, mainly in the fact that you could afford clubs and standard improved. The championship was still in May. It mm. hadn't changed, so there was no, no improvement to what the course you, you took it as you found it. Mm. But yeah. certainly there was an awful lot of good players suddenly emerging onto the scene. And, yeah, one of those was a table tennis player who give you your uh, fourth, fifth, yeah, that was me. And then the sixth championship win, Barry Collister. Yes, yes. Table right. tennis man. Yes, and, he was, uh, wasn't he? He was yeah. another kind of character about town. And, yeah, he had uh, had, had an ability and, and got through. But uh, you've seen him off worse than me, 10 and 9. 10 and 9, yes. Yeah. There's a little well, story behind uh, 1980, that particular championship. Uh, we'd covered it for Manx Radio, done a bit of uh, reporting on it. And Charlie Webster said... Uh, this was 84 it was he said he said you seem to handle the, the broadcasting all right he said how are you fixed for standing in to do the grand prix he said what do you think and i said well i wouldn't mind having a go at it i said mm. jeff carroll is not my cousin has not give us any recommendations he doesn't you know think i'm capable <coughs> i said i'll give it a go and that was uh, kind of a 
a prelude to kind of being involved in golf commentary. Ten and ten and eight, I wasn't on the air too long, but <laughs> ten and nine. But it was the introduction for me through Manx Radio to do commentary so, for the TT and Grand Prix. So Jeff was already doing that. Oh yeah, Jeff. Yes, Jeff right. had been well yeah. in from '68, timekeeper, and then right. Jack Cretney's voice broke at Bella Crane, and he had to go on air, and they said. He knows what he's on about. He's yeah. and Jack Cretney was getting older, and they give him the offer of the job at Belize. Right. Yes, because Jeff used to um, come and cover the, the golf, golf as yeah. well, and uh, he, he was never short of a word, was <laughs> no, he? No. And he always stepped in right at the one mo, the second that you'd lost or <laughs> yeah. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what about this? Yeah. Um, and I, I do recall listening to him uh, interviewing the two finalists in the Ladies Bowls Championship. And the two ladies involved were, I don't know what the right word is, but they weren't saying much. Yeah. And <laughs> Jeff was, and how does it feel to be a champion like this? And so forth and so forth and rabbit on and on and on. And the, the lady said, eh, it's OK. <laughs> so he then put about 10 sentences together to the, the lady who'd lost. And she said, not so good. That's a good. <laughs> that, that was the interview, really. Three hundred yeah. words from Jeff and about four from the two ladies involved. Yeah, he was a star man on that. In fact, if him and your mother had got together, they could have caused a bit of disruption. <laughs> they could have had the event stopped. <laughs> uh, he always appeared in his whole life. He was he was a large character, but he always seemed to be ambling and wandering about and as yes. you say I know yeah. he fell out with Ray Ennett when he kind of stuck a microphone <laughs> where he shouldn't have done where he shouldn't have done and uh, <laughs> uh, different things but he always had an ability to be in your sight line as well you know like standing on the green <laughs> one person absolutely banging the line of where you hit where you wanted with, to would, be. would be Jeff <laughs> but you can't fault him because Manx Radio covered championships from 68 and give you the benefit of uh, possibly if you've kept the recordings of oh. of your, your, the way yes, things I were. No, I don't think so. No, so, no it was um, it was a big deal. Oh, Max was Radio it, yeah. then, wasn't it? With yeah. regular reports, much yeah. as things like the end to end and uh, power the, boat race, the parish walk, of yeah, course. Parish walk, days, so. yeah, yeah, with Dermot O'Toole out in front and various <laughs> other things. But uh, he, he got involved in it, and it's sadly lacking now, unfortunately. It's, uh, he did hit his kind of reporting, as quite a few of us did in those days, writing or anything as a favour to the sport. Yes. And yes. now it's the first thing that people ask is how much. Hmm. And it's a detriment, really, to be fair. I'm delighted that we've kept records you know, yes. it can go oh, through and crikey, what have yeah. you, yeah. Absolutely. So then we were on to, after we'd beaten Billy Collister, 85, you were still continuing on in your in the northern counties, and you met a fella called Organ <laughs> yes. on one of these yes. trips. Yes, I, I think it was at uh, Royal Liverpool, and there was this uh, youngster from Lancashire who was going to be the next best thing, and his name was Hogan Stott. And uh, he came up to me on the first tee and said, hello, <laughs> my name's Organ. <laughs> Which was, was uh, a surprise. <laughs> yeah, never heard of any. <laughs> What's your second name, Hammond? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah that, was, uh, that was a funny moment. <laughs> organ, organ Stott. Organ. Oh, God damn me, yeah, that would be it. Of yeah. course, family had arrived the same as me, virtually yes, the same. Yes, same. And, uh, well, quite the same moment, but nearly. No, no, no. We, we were we were kind of uh, parents, and uh, absolute delight to to say that they both carried on with golf. Mm. And there was a memorable moment when you're talking about Northern Counties, Brombra, when uh, Dave in the junior Northern Counties uh, finished like you had. You'd you'd seen us through at uh, Seaton Carew. Mm. Uh, the first time we'd ever got off the bottom I played absolutely abysmal that day I was suicidal uh, uh, probably at the, the, the way the look had been going if I'd have rang the Samaritans they would have been engaged and it worked out that we'd won got <laughs> off the bottom by one yes. and Jay yes. Sutton went up to take the prize for the best first round well I was very fortunate because um, I think I was probably first out <laughs> <laughs> 
and it was one of those beautiful mornings on a breath of wind and I was playing with uh, Peter Diebel who I played with two or three times uh, unfortunately for him who was I'm sure he was British amateur champion once or twice or certainly English amateur certainly top man wasn't he? yes and uh, Northumberland yes um, and he had he had he just stood to a golf ball exactly as you should and he had a very compact swing and he hit it extremely well and well his results don't for himself and I played with him and uh, um, I suppose I must have beaten him to get the best round but uh, uh, yeah so I had the best of the weather by by a mile and uh, so that was that was good to sort of do something good when it mattered and uh, yes we uh, got off the, the bottom, bottom. Yeah. got off the bottom I can well remember because Jimmy Skillicorn actually got around him. <laughs> Did he? So it was that important to him that uh, he didn't want <laughs> to miss out on the occasion. <laughs> and Jim got the round in. And I got a photograph somewhere, I think, back at the Queen's Hotel or the Grand Hotel that we stopped at. And it was big celebration. I still couldn't cheer me up like with the, the, the poor performance. But uh, but who, when... Who think, was the county that we beat? Uh, Cumbria. Was it? Yeah. Cumbria, Crikey. the fella, fella came to the last, and uh, Don Davies came rushing in to the to the clubhouse where we were thinking, you know, another seventh place. And he said, "We're off the bottom. We're off the bottom." So what do you mean? He said, uh, "I forget the fella's name." He said he's just three putted the eighteenth because it was a, a tough finish. Yes. Remember the seventeenth yeah, yeah, yeah. at Seton Carew, the two tier green. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you couldn't absolutely. afford to, to yeah, go, you yeah, know, and, and yeah, bunkers so either side. Yeah. And then he'd come out, I can't think of it, he's, his face is in me, in me mind, but his name isn't. And uh, he, we were off the bottom, we're off, oh, absolute delight. Went up, we've have gone on to have some memorable results, but talking about Dave, when he, when he started to play, and Mark as well, yep. Kevin and Peter in, in my kind of side of things, but uh, we went away to Bromborough and uh, Dave won the best first round. Yes, yes. It that was, always that was a memorable one. It? Yes, absolutely. He, uh, he was thrilled, I'm sure. Absolutely yeah. thrilled. <laughs> Fortunately, that. we've got some photos of that one. We have got <laughs> yes, plenty of photographs of that one. So. We actually finished ahead of Yorkshire <laughs> in third place in the wow. junior northern well. counties. Um, and I, I think that was... Might have been the year that Mark played with Nick Doherty. Correct. Yeah. Who was yeah. the you know the main Sky man, yeah. Sky TV man these yeah. days. And was he was a little dumpy fourteen year old who yeah. was going to be the next best thing for for and England at the time? I think in that team that would have played, there was Kelso Beggs, there was uh, Kevin, Kevin Moore, uh, Mark, Dave, David Jones. Yes, yeah, Davy. Another, and Alan Lang. Right. Gosh, yeah. And they've all gone to establish themselves too, like and and sadly Davy. Yeah, well, we know the story about that and mm. yeah, yeah, it was it's sadness that we remember him, but we do remember him with affection. Mm. Uh, I remember John Simpson getting told that you wouldn't be able to tame him, but he was an absolute gem in the times <laughs> that we were involved. Yes, yes, he was a good friend to you knew where so you many. were you knew where you were with Davy Jones. <laughs> yes. But championship-wise, uh, you're moving on, 85. After beating Barry, you got your seventh championship win and another big win as well. Adrian Copley was still about and playing quite well. But 85, there wasn't many spectators. Remember the petrol strike? Down at Peel, and not many could get down. The right. tanker drivers went on strike. Right. And, no, I uh, don't, don't, don't remember, remember that. No. Yeah. I must have had enough fuel myself to get there. So. Yeah. I, I went down Maybe. to watch it, but the boys had been in TT week and left some uh, two-stroke in with Castrol R. Right. And I headed from Douglas to Peel smelling like a racing bike. But we got down. We, we saw, you, <laughs> saw you win down there. And that gave you your seventh championship win. And then the weather wasn't very good in 86 and uh, down at Peel, at, at Castletown. Castletown had come back on the agenda for hosting championships. And 172 was a reflection on how difficult mm. the course was. But Andrew Kane. One, one or more had best qualifying score. 
Well, we don't talk about that. Oh, I, think I so. did. I you did. did. You did. Then, um, yeah. Highest probably ever. <laughs> yeah, probably score. would be. There was only five shots between first yeah. and sixteenth. Well, the the thing I remember most was, I mean, it was a wild, wicked day. Very, very windy, as you re- remember, and rain. And uh, of course, the the hotel was was in use, and the the. Anybody who remembers the hotel remember the putting green down at the side of it, and we were sheltering round the corner of the just uh, of the hotel, just up from the putting green, watching to see when it was our turn to go, and we were next up, and there was somebody on the tee getting ready to play. Anyway, the next moment there was a couple of bangs, and uh, a ball landed um, just in front of me that had actually landed on the top of Murray Crow's, as the pro shop was, single story, flat roof, from the 18th tee, which tells yeah, you how yeah, far, far it was, was yeah. how strong the wind was. Yeah. And it had landed on the roof and cleared the cars that were parked, landed on the tarmac and bounced past me onto the putting green. Putting green, green off the 18th was, tee. was lying on the putting green. So I was like, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's out of bounds. Anyway, I sort of switched my attention back to whoever was on the first tee. And he had his head down into this force 10 and jigged down at the ball and hit it up into the air, skied it. Well, it was so windy, he sort of, he sort of went up into the air and then the wind took it back over his head. It cleared the cars, landed on the tarmac and bounced down onto the putting green. So there were two yeah. balls on the putting green. Dear me. One, both out of bounds. One from the first tee, one from, from the first <laughs> tee. No, Which that's... is just absolutely outrageous. Yeah. Just, you just couldn't possibly imagine that such a thing w- would, would happen. But it, but it did. I know on that particular day, the, uh, one of our playing partners said he'd had enough. And I played with a chap called Dave Inston. Right. Whose name came up in conversation with you that... He'd actually qualified for the championship. Yes. Well, he had, but only yeah. qualified to, to play. play. Yes. Yeah, he's not yes. Qualified yes. as we know qualifying is. Yes. And we walked off the 18th, looked at one another and said, I don't fancy getting out of the gear. And to his eternal credit, he said, well, I don't either. Yeah. And we walked straight on to the first tee yeah. and did 36 consecutive holes. Yes, I, I, I remember the, the hotel um, was completely ill-prepared for what was required oh, yeah. because I think we went in sort of wet, as you said, and said, um, have you got any sandwiches? And uh, the guy in the bar down said, well, I'll, um, I'll contact the chef. So he came back after a moment and said, yes, we can have ham sandwiches for you in 45 minutes. Mm. Well, we had about 10 minutes to go, so Correct. I think lunch was a Mars bar <laughs> from the shop. Yeah. No, that was, yeah, sad the hotel is not there now because you would have had a terrific complex as it always has been. Yeah. But uh, certainly, yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't ideal for for hosting with locker rooms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was it? <laughs> no, no. Had no. some... They re- tolerated us, I think, was yeah. probably the best description. Yeah, that would be the way you would describe it. And that was the reason why they didn't go to Castletown to play. It was, uh, there was a charge always and there was... There was always a kind of complication with with getting coordination between the hotel yeah, and yeah. and the, the 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 union at the time. So Andrew Kane, but yeah, it was a poor poor weather. Yes, on that one. yeah, I think the all week it was, it was semi final stage. That yes, was. Yeah. yes, Andrew was um, again up and coming and uh, um, really good player, two three handicap maybe, which in those days meant you could play. Yeah. Um, particularly now with the new uh, <laughs> the new world handicap system, oh, okay. it's uh, <laughs> uh, saturated uh, by scratch uh, men. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a bit different, but uh, he may even have been better than that. But uh, he could certainly play anyway. Mm. So we had to wait then for after that, after Andrew Kane in 1986, to get your next win, which was 87. And then again, another person who'd arrived on the scene, he only ever qualified once, but made a final. Right. Uh, Simon Duggan, Rowney. Yes, yes. Um, 
Simon's golf was characterized by hitting the ball sensationally up into the air. I could never work out how he could hit it so high. <laughs> Whereas mine always go tend to sort of go very low. And he was hitting it right up into the sky, which was always looked good. A good, good yeah. thing. But it, yeah. as I say, it was strange that uh, qualified once made the final. Uh, we haven't checked out the records on that. Moving on, like again into the northern counties, there was a, a unique moment happened, I think, at Seton Carew as well, where you'd had your success, where J Sutton, D Sutton and M Sutton strolled out as half the island team. Yes, yeah, that was uh, that was quite something. Um, I was a very f- proud dad to have them to have them along. I don't know what they thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what they're embarrassment. But, you know, uh, you know what they're like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't give you any credit whatsoever. Maybe, maybe uh, at the back of their mind, they're saying, "Well, he's not such a bad lad either." Well, but that was know. a unique kind of happening, really. Wasn't yes, yes, it, when it that, was when yes. that took place. Yes, yeah, I've got that on <laughs> film actually. Right. Yeah, we've, yes. got, we've got a DVD Excellent. of that uh, somewhere in my extensive collection. So yeah. that would be it. So then the rest of it is kind of uh, also competed Jay Sutton from then on, really, isn't it? Uh, 89, qualified 1-5-2 at Douglas, lost to, in the semi-final to Gary Ash, who went on to win it in 89. Uh, you, he beat you 4-3, and three, but he was mm. another name mm. that had come on the scene, and it? He mm. had, like, uh, he beat Foley, Lord Goat, and Foley Verica, Lord Goat, in the final... And there were some good players about. Mm, Wilson yeah, 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 possibly well, would exactly. have been still about, you know, at yeah. that particular time. Yeah. And, yeah, it was it was good stuff. Yeah, Gary was uh, very adept on the greens. Um, and I, I seem to remember um, he held a, a couple of good putts just when I sort of thought, yeah, he could three-putt this. Yeah. And, uh, well, he didn't. He actually put it in the <laughs> hole, <laughs> yeah. which was inconsiderate, I felt. But, uh, Something where you have to stand back in match play and watch your opponent do it. And then yeah, I mean, that's you the whole aim of it. <laughs> it is, yeah. You have to suffer his good luck uh, yeah. and then you have yeah. to suffer your own bad luck. Or you, you feel as though you, you are. Like, yeah, yes, indeed. And that would be the thing about it. Yes. Uh, into the 90s now, so we're into another decade of you qualifying on seven decades and eight wins. And uh, again, it was uh, out of peel. And Gary Ash was the man who inflicted the damage again. <laughs> I know, I know. Yes, <laughs> back, back yes. to back losses for yes, Jay Sutton. Yes, yeah. Um, Th- three and two this time. Yes, I, I think he had, when we got near the greens, he was certainly uh, more proficient than I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, moving on to uh, 91, Simon Miller, current greenkeeper down there at Rowney. And you went 20 holes before he saw you off. Yes, Simon had um, caddied for me on occasion. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he caddied for me when I won at, uh, at Rowney against Lippo Clark. Um, yeah, possibly. As a, as a, as a kid. Um, but um, Simon's sort of gone on to, as you say, greenkeeper at Rowney. And uh, Rowney's greens are quite remarkable. Um, very, very good. Yes, the uh, the strategy that he uses down there with lots of hollow tining in September and infill with lots and lots of sand supported by lots of the members um, seems to keep them in excellent order all year. So he does extremely well, really. It's mainly him. <laughs> him, yeah, that's it. Yeah, such I as... believe. Such is the way it is. And just, yeah. just reflection there again when how your mind works. You had the pleasure of having a caddy win the championship. Mike Cooley was a yes, regular caddy course. for you, wasn't he? Yes. We'd forgotten yes. about that. Sorry, Mike. Yes. yes and then so. uh, he came through with the Tim Watson uh, thing of never winning a, a championship but competing in so many finals and semi-finals. Again, it's on record, but... Mike had caddied for you for your success. Yes, yes. I used to play uh, a lot of golf with with Mike uh, in my youth. And uh, um, it's been really good to be able to go down to Rowney and play with him over in latter years. And uh, he plays with my brother Guy. 
um, quite great. frequently. Um, so we, we've had some uh, uh, some good games down there, and Mike's the most adept chipper and putter. Uh, and I think he even managed to get his handicap down to four uh, mm. in this summer, which uh, means we've started to beat him. Very good. <laughs> From that handicap. Yeah, that's uh, that's the thing about it. Yeah, Mike won the championship 74, I think, at, and it was name was on it. Yes. Yes, was seventy four. He played Paul Crellin in the semi final and got up and down from a dustbin on the seventeenth and then did likewise on eighteen and left Paul reflecting and shaking his head and got through to the final and then Tim Watson had an un unusual record of not being able to produce the goods. Yes. In the final. It's like saying in the T T who do you think is the best rider never best to run have, up. Yeah, yeah, never to have won a a TT and your mind goes immediately to Bob Jackson and various other fellas who are right up there all the time but then just fail to make it's it. Almost, it's almost sort of detrimental, but the fact is that if they were second, they had to be pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah, fair comment. Yeah. yeah it was a, a fact, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so Simon Miller, senior off, and then back at Rowney again for whatever reason, 96 Five-year spell off there from 91 to 96, Jules, uh, where you didn't either compete or you were... Oh, I'm sure I competed, but um, yeah, that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> also played, was, uh, and then back in 96, qualifying again at Rowney with 145, so better than 91. And another fellow who'd come through... He'd been given his chance in the Ireland team in 1985, a Peel man, a great admirer of Godfrey Kelly and had his attitude as well, but you couldn't fault Mark Pugh for being consistent. No, no, Mark has, uh, well, he's been a standing golfer for, for decades, always, and still is. Um, you know, very straight, good putter, um, just the attributes you you need in well, particularly in match play as well. To you know, infuriating opponent who can always you can always see his ball <laughs> yes. on the fairway or yeah. on the green. Or <laughs> he's going to get a three from there, yes. and he's going to get a four. But yes, yes. You know, halfway up the hedge with one foot in, in the ditch. Or one or two that you played uh, would be roundabout. So two thousand then. There's another four year gap there. Jules one four six at Douglas. Uh, three and two to Nicky Kelly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? Funny you don't sort of remember the losses quite the same as you do the no, success, no. do you? <laughs> and we don't, yeah. don't have any red figures from 2003, but we're entering another decade there. You see, when we go from from the previous one, which would be the 2000s, so you would qualify for another decade in qualifying for that. And 2003, it was... 149 at Castletown, lost to Gary Wilson, one down. 2004, 140 at Mount Murray, lost to Robert Braid, another person who'd come through. I suppose if you said of a person, because he beat you in 2005 at Ramsey, who's yet to win a championship but thoroughly deserves one, it'd be Andrew Challoner. Yes, yeah, Challoner has he, uh, sort of been at the top of Manx Golf uh, for so many years. Um, without it sort of finally succeeding, but uh, he's uh, you know again an exceptional player and uh, always one that you wouldn't want to play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be the way you would look at it. You'd be looking at the draw, saying, "Hope we don't get Chal." Yes, but yeah, that's uh, right. even as as late as two thousand and twenty one, he's still yet to win a championship. 2005, it was Andrew Challoner in the first round, lost to him. 2006, Steve Ellis, a professional, he was a good player, Steve, yeah, and good friend of yours as well, weren't you? Yes, yes. We, uh, we had, uh, when I used to play at, at Castletown, we had a good group of, of guys and players that we would uh, all turn up at the same time and sort of go out together. And uh, um, we had, uh, I particularly remember um, some of the turkey shoots we play where one would be a, like a four-man Texas scramble mm. and we used to have great fun and do some uh, astonishing scores really with Steve's help he he was very adept at hitting a, a driver off the deck on the par fives um, you could always rely on him to sort of 
hit this thing much further and much straighter than anybody else could do. Mm. Um, and we we went away. There was uh, a handful of us who would go away and play in the Mid-amateur. Logan Trophy, yeah, yeah the over thirty yeah. fives. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that was that was fun. Um, we played some good courses. Uh, Birkdale. We played Birkdale on one occasion. Um, yeah, some good courses. Uh, Prince's, you know, which is next to Royal St George's, which is was the open was their venue. Yeah, yeah. Open venue. Due to be there shortly, I think. Didn't it? Hmm. So St Andrews this year or next year. Yeah. Yeah, Steve uh, Douglas again. Davy Jones. You didn't lose to duck eggs, as they say. <laughs> 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 that was 2007, yes. 2008, a fellow called Tom Gandhi. That's a familiar name. Yes. Something yes. telling me went on to be quite good. Yes. At yes. Brownie, that quite was uh, yes. Tom Gandhi, four and three. And then Herman Lobster. Lobster. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, who was only 13 or 14. Yeah. Which was, uh, it was. <laughs> 2012, that one. 2012. Yeah. 2013, Kevin Moore, who went on to win it. Senior off in the uh, in the semi final six and five, and then bringing us right up to date and getting very near. We've had the sign from the uh, the scrutineers department. The clerk of the course has just signalled. <laughs> yeah. Roads are the roads, roads are going to open. Roads shortly. are open very <laughs> shortly. They're putting the lights out down here at Thornton's Associates and yeah. uh, in yeah. Timwell Mills, and must be getting near lunchtime at least. Bang up to date, Jules, after a, a fantastic little insight into the life and times i'm sure we could go on for another hour but uh, bringing us right up to date 2021 ireland senior champion yes yes first time you've won the the uh the 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 trophy for the best qualifier over 50 on a number of occasions the bob cowan but i know you were delighted to get the senior trophy for the first time yes well um i think when i got to the age where I could play it sort of just just didn't sort of fit into my schedule on a on a Sunday I didn't really appreciate what it was all about really so the first year or two or three I, I didn't play um and then when I didn't wanted to do well I didn't <laughs> funnily enough <laughs> <laughs> I know how you feel yeah um so uh, yes I played really well this year um and uh, finished badly but but ended up with a with a good score, which was just enough. And um, then I was able to go and play at uh, Woodall Spa in the uh, tournament for the champion of each county, which was, uh, and saw you there, because, of course, Kevin won the championship and uh, uh, Freddie Dancox won the juniors. Junior, so yeah. we were all there, sort of much of the same time, although we hardly saw each other because you were all doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, so, so that was... Uh, a very special moment too. Bringing us bang up to date here down at uh, Timbald Mills with uh, the qualified at 152 at Rowney's seventh decade and all kinds of records and uh, all down there forever. Jules, it's been an absolute delight to uh, to have spent the time with you. As I say, we could go on for, I'm sure, another couple of hours. <laughs> but uh, for... The record, this has been Roy Moore interviewing Julian Sutton about his life and times in golf on the Isle of Man and elsewhere. So I suppose in true TT tradition, we say from Roy Moore from St. John's, we hand you back to the clubhouse. Great. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.